angel greetings. I'm Janet Booth, a professional astrologer from West Hartford, Connecticut, and welcome to my program on astrology called Looking Up. Today's episode is July and August 2019 in depth, and it kind of follows on to our prior show that was about the summer of 2019. I called it sultry summer because I think it's going to be steamy, hot, a lot of wet, a lot of rain, probably. Anyway, we talked about the summer solstice chart at that point and made a brief mention of eclipses that were coming up in July as well as the Mercury retrograde that's coming in July. So I thought I would go into some of those in more depth today and also talk about the new and full moons following those eclipses. So first I want to just backtrack a little bit and I don't think I mentioned, because I went and I uh, watched the show, I listened. On the summer solstice, I talked a lot about how important Neptune is at this time, but it was at an actual standstill. And that's from the optical illusion called retrograde, where because Earth is also in motion, sometimes the planets look like they're coming to a stop and changing to the opposite direction for a while. So when a planet is sitting, it's called on station, and it kind of gives more force to that degree where it's sitting. So anything that it's hitting in somebody's chart is getting that visit for an extra long time. You know, when I look at something like Neptune that's slow to start off with, and I go, oh, here it comes to a stop, right, um, I think it was on the day after the solstice. But it looked like it didn't even leave the degree it was in for like all of June, all of July, and that was at 18 degrees of Pisces. So if you have something around 18 degrees of Pisces or the other three signs that get hit that are part of what we call the mutable signs, which would be Gemini, Virgo, and Sagittarius, anything in that range is really getting a wallop by Neptune right now. And Neptune just loves to envelop you in its fog and it's hard to see clearly. And speaking of clearly, I'll put on my glasses so I can see my notes clearly. And I mentioned also how Jupiter and Neptune are in that 90 degree, roughly 90 degree position. It was exact on the 16th of June, but it's within four degrees or less all summer long. And that's very close out of 360 degrees. So it really is kind of the umbrella that hangs over the whole season and says there is the opportunity to get some kind of clarity or bring things out into the open that Jupiter is famous for, and especially now that it's in its home sign of Sagittarius, when it's forcing the issue with Neptune, which wants to keep things in the shadows, or it can have a very deceptive. Sometimes it's just we misspeak because we misunderstand something, but sometimes there's outright lies. So I think more lies are kind of coming out with the Jupiter-Neptune square, and I did mention that before. Uh, so their range, I said how they're within four degrees of each other, or of that 90 degree perfect square, and they're ranging between 14 to 18 degrees of those four signs that I mentioned, Gemini, Virgo, Sag, Pisces. So really, if you've got anything in that neighborhood in your chart, and you might have more than one thing in that neighborhood of your chart, that would be the part to take a close look at, you know, what of those 12 pieces of pie called the houses that are like the departments of your chart, where are those being impacted, as well as because each planet rules a sign, Jupiter rules Sagittarius, well it's in Sag, so that's that house. Oh right, and Pisces rules, um, Neptune rules Pisces and it's in the sign it rules, so those are the houses to look at. Um, and that makes this square extra strong because it's happening from the rulership sign of both of these hefty planets. Okay, so knowing that we kind of have that umbrella of possible confusion and things like that hanging over us, 
there's still some pretty interesting uh, and nice combinations that are coming along during the summer. And we'll talk about those. I guess I'll talk about those right now before I go into the eclipses. So Mars takes about two years to go around the whole zodiac. And that means it's not necessarily around the sign where the sun is going to come through. And the sun always has Mercury fairly close to it, never gets more than one sign away from the sun. And Venus never gets more than two signs away from the sun, but it's not always in the same sign. Well, this summer, we have Mercury and Mars traveling very close together for quite a bit of the time. And I did talk about that in the June show, Sultry Summer. And I said I thought they might be, at the same degree, conjunct three times. Well, only two of those are in the sort of retrograde pattern, and those were on June 18th and then July 8th. And then Mercury moves so far back, Mars gets pretty far ahead, you know, then they're kind of close in Leo but not really together, and it's only once they're both in Virgo that they finally have their last conjunction for a while, and that's on the 3rd of September. And if I recall correctly, you know, I rate all the days one is the worst up to five is the best, and I'm really stingy with my fives. There's only one five of all of 2019, and it's that September 3rd. So that's a pretty good date. Anyway, we've got a lot of emphasis on Leo. You know, the main first sign of summer is Cancer. So the sun goes into Cancer at the summer solstice. And we know Venus is traveling behind the sun now, going to catch up during the course of the summer. So it's in Cancer. And Mercury is going to go back and forth between Leo and Cancer. And Mars, uh, I'm, yeah, I think it's already finished up and gone into Cancer, um, into Leo. Let's see. Nope. Mars goes into Leo the 1st of July. Okay. So... When they really start gathering, if you would, is more in the sign of Leo than in the sign of Cancer. And we're actually going to have one week between August 11th and August 18th, and that's surrounding the August 15th full moon, when we've got all four of what we call the personal planets or the quick moving heavenly bodies Sun, Mercury, Venus, Mars, all of them are in Leo. And we're just going to put a whole lot of emphasis on whatever Leo means. Well, Leo is fun and creativity and sunniness. Leo also means children and everything related to children. And Cancer is a lot about families and nurturing and protecting. And it's a kind of home and family unit type of sign. And I thought about how all this emphasis on Cancer and then Leo and I was watching in the news about what's happening at our border and how children are basically caged and not being cared for in any manner. And I think that that situation is really going to come under a giant magnifying glass as we come through the summer. And it has to be addressed and rectified. And we might even say that, you know, Jupiter amplifies what it's involved with. And Neptune is related to compassion. So there's even an international side to Jupiter and Sagittarius, the sign it rules. So, you know, the, the sort of heart that needs to come out to take different care of immigrants, of refugees, basically. That's, that's mostly who's locked up at the border. Um, so expect to have a lot of that in the news all summer long. Let's just say that. And I also had mentioned, I believe, about Juno, the marriage asteroid. And that has about a, I don't know, somewhere between four and six year orbit. And it's also heading into Leo. So when this other pileup of planets comes in Leo in August, Juno's right in there with them. And this would put a lot of focus on marital matters. It might even be on things like about gay marriage, because that's one of the sort of marriage topics of this time. And we see that, 
Okay. Mars is together with Juno August 3rd. Venus August 19th. Sun with Juno August 22nd. Mercury with Juno on the new moon of the 30th of August. So there was, in fact, I believe it's August 10th. I wrote this down somewhere. You wouldn't want to see my notes. But yes, I'm pretty sure that that's the date that I had earmarked as being a good candidate for if you wanted to get married this summer. That was a nice potential wedding date. And it was a Saturday also. Oh, yep, there it is, August 10th. If you're going to get married, you probably already had your plans in motion, but sometimes people have to act quickly or get impulsive. And speaking of acting quickly, when we were talking about Mercury and Mars together, well, Mars is the speedy planet, and Mercury is thoughts and speech. So sometimes there's blurting, there's you know jumping to conclusions, thinking too quickly, speaking too quickly. And this is a really good time to kind of slow things down. And we know that like Taurus is one of the slower signs or the sort of get grounded, become steady footed. And yet we have Uranus going through Taurus, which kind of makes things volatile. And we will have near the end of July and beginning of August, the sun first is in that 90 degree square from Leo to Taurus on the 29th of July. August 2nd, Venus does the same. So those would be a little bit bumpier times for relationship matters. But in general, because we have Venus traveling so close to the sun, it is a time where a lot of heart and love and affection is coming out. They will be within five degrees of each other, which is very close. To it. When we say something is five or less degrees from the sun, we call it a combust conjunction like the planet is being burned up in the rays of the sun. It means also if you had a telescope, you could not even separate that planet from the sun and see it. So within five degrees from July 26th all the way to September 3rd. And within that range, they're within just one degree from August 10th to the 17th, which is pretty much that same week when we have all the guys in Leo and around that full moon on the 15th, and the exact coming together of Venus and the Sun is on the 14th of August. So right around that full moon will probably be really great sort of romantic time. Exciting. Uh, Venus and Mars will be together on August 24th, and that's also considered kind of hot. You know, the planet of attraction with the planet of passion and action. And now I wouldn't say that that's a good time for a wedding because it's in the waning portion of the moon cycle and you usually want a wedding date when the moon is growing in light rather than decreasing in light. Hmm, let's see what else is exciting in here. Oh, okay, we'll get to that. There's another sort of long-term positive factor in place and this is with a dwarf planet, Ceres, C-E-R-E-S, same root word as cereal, named for the Roman goddess of harvest. Uh, the Greek name would be Demeter, like a Earth Mother. And Chiron, which is not given planetary status, it is, in my opinion, as strong as a planet, but it lies between Saturn and Uranus, and it has a wide orbit. It swings out to Uranus and into Saturn almost. And it's sort of a go-between between between the established ways of doing things and getting into something that's more sort of metaphysical or new age or modern. Okay. And Chiron's nickname is the Wounded Healer because it shows where we have a weak spot in our life that needs to be shored up. But I like to call it the repair man because it does bring improvements and good ideas and solutions to problems. And these two are traveling a third of the sky apart called a trine, which is considered very favorable. And that goes on for a pretty long time because both of them were slowing down to change direction. So they came within five degrees of each other on May 18th and they remain within that five degrees until the 13th of September. So that's almost four months. 
And that's because in July, about nine days apart, Chiron is stopping to turn backwards on the 7th of July, and Ceres is stopping to turn forward on the 17th of July. So both of those are kind of close to the lunar eclipse on the 16th, which we'll be talking about shortly. And their exact times that they're in this trine are June 6th and August 27th. And what I would say is, and it kind of goes back to that topic when we were talking about the children in cages, Ceres as that maternal energy and Chiron as the fix the problem energy. So we really need to figure out how to fix the problem for all kinds of children that are in need. We have a lot of poverty in this country. We have a lot of poverty in this world. And it's weird because there's a lot of wealth and resources too. So there's just the distribution of that is so out of whack, it's not even funny. And we hope that that will be addressed more in the coming years by our legislatures. Okay, so on to the eclipses and new moons. So what is an eclipse? An eclipse is occultation, a blocking, and a solar eclipse is when the moon comes between the earth and the sun and totally blocks out or partially blocks out the sun from our viewpoint. A lunar eclipse is when the earth gets between the sun and the moon. Usually the moon is reflecting back the sun's light, but the earth's shadow puts the moon into a shadow. Now, we're always having the moon going around the earth and the earth and the moon going around the sun, but they don't always block each other. We have new moons and full moons every month. Only when they're lined up on the right sort of plane that they can actually block each other out. And when they're lined up like that, they are close to the intersection of those orbits. See, there's like a differential, a different angle between the moon going around the earth and the earth going around the sun. You know, we're on that 23 and a half degree tilt, but the moon's not. So those two orbits have intersection points, and those intersections are called the nodes, N-O-D-E-S, the nodes of the moon or the moon, lunar nodes. So when you have a new moon or a full moon in the range, about half a sign or so, within one node or the other, that's when you're going to have these eclipses. So the nodes move backwards through the zodiac, and right now they are in the signs of Cancer and Capricorn. And they usually change signs about every year and a half or so. And that's when you know, eclipse is shifting into the different sign pairs. Well, Capricorn is about government, established ways of doing things. It's a winter sign. It's the sign of the winter solstice. It's Saturn's sign, and Saturn is there in that sign now. And that can be kind of cold, kind of cold-hearted. It says, well, we have rules. And if you don't pay, you know, play by the rules, well, you're going to have to be punished. And on the other softer side, here's cancer, ruled by the moon. How a mother can, you know, sometimes we'll say, oh, that's a face only a mother can love. A mother loves her children no matter what, pretty much. I mean, sometimes there's dysfunction, and that's not true. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have some guidelines and rules. But there's, you know, emotion versus, you know, strict, practical, cool, whatever. So a node is in one sign, north node it's called, south node in the opposite sign. So right now we have the south node going through Capricorn, the north node going through Cancer. The north node is what we're supposed to be growing and developing toward, or kind of approaching and consuming, and the south node is what we should be releasing, or eliminating, being done with. So this says... Some of the laws really need to go or be changed. You know, it's the Capricorn end that's on the release. And embrace more of the caring and nurturing and being good parents or warm and loving. Um, and I mean that in a sort of global parenting way too or a generic, universal. So we've got the new moon is in Cancer. So it's in that sign of the North Node. And this is on Jan uh, January, right. July 2nd, 
And that's what one wants to help us grow towards this nurturing side. And then the full moon, two weeks later, on the 16th of July, the moon is in Capricorn. The sun is still in Cancer, but they're the opposite signs. So that would be considered a south node eclipse with the moon near Capricorn, or in Capricorn, and near Pluto there. And Pluto is a planet about elimination and taking out the garbage. Some people call it the garbage man of the zodiac. So there's something that really kind of needs to go when we get to that eclipse. Now we have at both of these eclipses that trine that I was telling you about between Ceres and Chiron, it's made into a grand trine, equilateral triangle, by Mercury. And Mercury hasn't moved too much because between the 2nd and the 16th, it turns retrograde on the 7th. So it's kind of slowing down, stopping, hanging out in the same part of the zodiac, that early degrees of Leo. And Ceres is at an early degree of Sagittarius, and Chiron is in the early degrees of Aries. So this is a fire grand trine, and usually we get fired up about things and get enthusiastic about stuff when we have a grand trine. And Mercury, it's the ideas, it's the communication, discussion, writing of things. So there might be a lot of people having sort of a very fertile, because Ceres is a fertility goddess as well as harvest, a very fertile writing time frame in the first half or more of July. If you're a writer, it should be very good for you. Okay. But we have got that pesky square that's really intruding on things from Jupiter and Neptune. And there is kind of a, okay, a different kind of triangle, square and a half on each side and joined by the square. My solar fire software calls it Thor's hammer. I usually call it the fickle finger of fate. It's not a pretty pattern because it's all difficult energies. But Mercury and Mars are in that, along with Juno. And I would say this is at the solar eclipse, June, uh, July 2nd. And an eclipse like this, I mean, a regular new moon, it's in effect for four weeks. An eclipse could be in effect for up to six months, sometimes more. But it really is a difficult aspect for communication within a marital situation if there's volatility involved. So we really need to dial back the anger and find a different outlet for it than just yelling at our mates. But that's kind of a, a tough pattern and oh, there's a little bit of Uranus thrown in there, so it's likely to get kind of crazy. The new moon, I mean sorry, the full moon that comes on the 16th of July, sun and moon across from each other, moon with Pluto, and it has a T that it's making with that way slow, far out past Pluto, Eris, that new planet, dwarf planet. And Eris's main keywords are disruption and chaos. So Pluto usually brings things to extremes. Full moons mean things come to a head. Eclipse full moon, they come to a head in a big way that has large impacts. So I think we're going to see some kind of heavy stuff coming down around that full moon eclipse. And I don't know how much it's going to impact the USA directly or if maybe just our president, but there is a very strong hit on President Trump's chart at that time to his Saturn which is about the degree where the sun will be, and Pluto and Saturn across from that. Saturn is pay the piper, chickens come home to roost. If you have been somebody who ignores laws and rules all your life, this is the kind of um, moment in time where some of that might come to a head. And he was born under a full moon eclipse too, so that would be things more likely to impact him at the time of a full moon eclipse. Now, we have a second new moon in July on the 31st. It's at 11, 12 p.m. Eastern, so that means it's going to show up as August 1st uh, in Greenwich time that some calendars 
measure things by because that's sort of universal time for the world. So you might see this listed as an August 1st new moon, but in America it's July 31st. You know, we have a word, blue moon, for two full moons in a calendar month. It's not the right term. I've told you about that, but we don't have any word for two new moons in the same month. But that can happen because new moons are about 29 and a half days apart and a month can be up to 31 days. In that particular new moon, we have a big cluster of uh, Leo planets. Moon is in there with Sun Venus and Mars Juno. Mars and Juno almost exactly together at that new moon. And Mercury has just started going forward, but it's back in Cancer. And it's kind of lined up across from Pluto. It's in about the position of that eclipse, still with the square with Eris. So we're going to see some of the events that are rumbling like thunder around that lunar eclipse in the middle of July also impact into August because that new moon, it carries it forward like Mercury's the messenger. It's carrying that message. Youch. Then we have full moon August 15th. That has big, beautiful pileup of the uh, personal planets in Leo, like I told you about. And that one does not have that sort of heaviness with the nodes. Actually, there's a good aspect, yes, from the sun and moon to that iris. Well, I'd say good aspect, sextile trine. They're considered good for most planets, but iris actually tends to behave a little worse with the good aspects. What can I tell you? Then everything starts moving into Virgo. And by the time we get to the, oh, let's see. Yes, the new moon on August 30th, we still have all the personal planets in the same sign. They're just all in Virgo instead of Leo. And Virgo has much more of a service orientation. You know, let me help you. Uh, it's an interest in health matters. And so we're going to be kind of shifting from fun, fun, fun in July into August. And as we go into September more, it's like, okay, now let's get down to work. We're going back to school. You know, vacations are over. And that one kind of has a hard um, pattern cooking up with the health mm, asteroid, Hygieia, same root word as hygiene and series. So I would say it's a month where you really want to take good care of your health. And by then, September comes along and we'll be back after summer break and we'll talk about more exciting planetary stuff on Looking Up. Mm -hmm.